Hello, my name is Neil Ferguson. I run, try to run the Hoover History Working Group uh, here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And uh, we've just had the privilege of hearing a terrific presentation from Kelly Hammond, uh, who's an assistant professor of East Asian history in the Department of History at the uh, University of Arkansas. Uh, the first book uh, project that uh, Kelly talked about uh, is China's Muslims and Japan's empire centering Islam in World War II, which was just published by the University of North Carolina Press. Uh, but she also talks about her next uh, book project uh, and gave us, I think, uh, an exciting uh, foretaste of what, what's coming next in her research. Uh, Kelly, thanks so much for coming to the History Working Group. Let me ask you first to talk a bit about how, how Muslims fit into the complex uh, pattern of conflict that we call World War II, and in particular, what their role was uh, in the war in East Asia. Great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Neil, and it's great to be here um, with the Hoover Working Group. And um, from, from the perspective of the, the, the work that I am, that I've just finished, um, the, the Muslims that I'm specifically dealing with in, in, my, in my book um, didn't really, weren't really involved so much in fighting against the Japanese. They were definitely more involved in the sort of intellectual and ideological pursuits of what the Japanese empire was trying to achieve in East Asia. And so through collaboration with the Japanese empire, um, a major the majority of the Muslim actors who um, are in my book um, sort of envisioned a way for themselves to implement uh, reform agendas uh, through education and through, you know, the building of new schools or through, you know, sponsorship to go on the Hajj. And um, they really sort of saw the Japanese empire as presenting them with an opportunity that they might not otherwise get from the Chinese nationalists or the Chinese communists or even from the Soviets at that time. How far was this just a case of my enemy's enemy is my friend? Or was there really something positive that the Japanese empire had to offer? Yeah, in some cases, I, I do think, in, in some ways, I do think it was sort of the, the lesser of, of, all, of, uh, lesser of all, all evils, you know, working, um, maybe perhaps working with the Japanese, they were able to implement things that the, the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists just couldn't get done at the time. But um, I think the way that we can sort of gauge that is by looking at um, the ways that the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists both reacted to um, the Japanese efforts to sort of curry favors to Muslims. And from the research that I've done, it seems quite clear that um, the Chinese nationalists in particular were, were quite concerned um, with the success, the quote unquote successes that the Japanese were having on the ground um, with Muslims in China and with recruiting Muslims in China. And I think part of that, um, Neil, had to do with the, the own sort of hollowness of their own ethnic policies at the time. Um, they had this sort of grand rhetoric and grand strategy, but on, on the ground, they, they really weren't doing much to support ethnic or religious minorities um, who found themselves living um, in, in China during this time. As a historian of, of Europe, I, I have vivid recollections of studying Waffen SS uh, Muslim units mm -hmm. uh, recruited in uh, Eastern Europe and in, in, in World War II. It strikes me that you're you're telling us a different story, and your your presentation had images of of kids uh, from uh, Muslim communities studying uh, Japanese. It it seems altogether more civilian. Uh, enterprise than than what happened uh, in in the European theater. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how the Japanese uh, 
uh, nationalists and imperialists thought about Islam, because uh, I re remember looking at the ways yeah. the Nazis rationalized uh, uh, Islam uh, and, and Muslim collaborators as part of, of the Third Reich. Was there a similar kind of rationalization uh, of the way Islam could fit into uh, a Japanese empire? Um, I think in some ways it was similar, but like I think you mentioned, it, it, it is quite different and there are no sort of SS units um, in, you know, that are, are equivalents to that in the in the Japanese theater or in the Pacific theater. I think a lot of that actually has to do with um, the, the, the sort of longer relationship of these areas with Islam and the fact that is in the majority of these places, Muslims are a vast minority. Also, it has to do with the fact that until really the 1920s and 1930s, there were almost no Muslims in Japan, only a very few, a handful of converts. And then the first Muslim community is actually uh, a group of people who come a uh, fleeing Russian per persecute or fleeing Bolshevik persecution and make their way uh, to Tokyo. So the fact that there were really no Muslims in Japan. Number one, they, they kind of had to make Muslims understandable to people living on the home islands. They had to teach Japanese people about who Muslims were. Um, and I think they're, the utility that they saw wasn't sort of a let's send them out and fight. It was more of a geopolitical or geostrategical, like let's make alliances with places beyond Asia using these people to help us create networks in you know north africa in the middle east in south asia by showing our you know quote unquote benevolence and our support for this group of people i was really fascinated by the saudi connection which i hadn't known about yeah. japan of course had a chronic problem where uh the minute american sanctions were imposed with uh oil shortages oil. so talk, talk a little bit about how oil plays into this uh, story in the 1940s. Right, so um, late 1930s, we or late 1938, the Japanese government decides that they are going to send, um, they're gonna sponsor a Hajj delegation of Chinese Muslims who on the process of going on the Hajj meet with a number of members of the Royal Saudi family, which obviously is something that's prearranged. And they uh, also create the sort of, grease the diplomatic wheels to sort of get um, the Saudi, di I'm sorry, Japanese diplomats to be able to go to negotiate for an oil concession. So April 1939, right before, you know, the war starts in Europe, this obviously this negotiation had to happen when it did, it wouldn't have happened after September 1939. Um, this, the Japanese send some very high ranking diplomats um, to Saudi Arabia to try to negotiate for an oil concession, which um, gets rebuffed. And there's, I, I've seen um, in the British archives uh, that the, the, you know, the British were aghast and the Americans were not impressed that this was happening either. So there was definitely pressure from the British and the Americans to sort of get the Saudis to say no. Um, but yeah, there was definitely, you know, it's like it's one of those what would have been had the Japanese secured an oil concession in Saudi Arabia in 1939, things might have turned out very differently. Well, I'm always a sucker for counterfactual questions. Yeah, me but too. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the next project, which takes uh, the story forward into the, the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, what what are going to be the, the the themes of this of this new new project and and how let me put it broadly, how, how different uh, is this geopolitical setting uh, for, for the people you're interested in? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one of the things that I've sort of noticed in the, 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 thing, the writing and the readings that I've done in the early 50s and early 60s is number one, just how anti-communist and how Western the propaganda is. Um, especially coming out of nationalist Taiwan and, um, you know, coming out of, yeah, mostly coming out of nationalist Taiwan. Um, 
and I saw some of that sort of resonating with what the, Jap the Japanese propaganda from the 1930s and 1940s, this very staunch anti-Soviet, anti-Western um, angle. And so I started be getting curious about um, how, number one, the post-occupation um, gov government in Japan, um, so after 1952, after the San Francisco Treaty, um, as well as the government in exile, the nationalist government in exile in Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China government, the communist government in China, how they were handling their outreach and their relationships, especially with new post-colonial Muslim states, um, like you know, Indonesia, which has a massive Muslim population and early on started out being, you know, under Sukarno started out being sort of socialist leaning and then flipped over to um, being staunchly anti-communist under Suharto. So we see sort of some backdoor negotiations taking place. And my first work is really a, a social and cultural history, but I'm, I'm, my second work is really more, I think, going to be a diplomatic and institutional history, looking at events like the Bandung Conference and looking at the backdoor negotiations that are taking place between Chinese Muslims, Japanese diplomats, and Chinese, um, you know, communist-supported Chinese Muslims, and how they're trying to sort of get um, present themselves to these new post-colonial Muslim states in the early years of the Cold War. And looking for allies and I, and I i as i work on the cold war writing the biography of henry kissinger i'm constantly right. struck by how unbipolar it was and how much more <laughs> right. complex and how much more of a multiplayer game the cold war was well a lot of the places you're talking about uh from xinjiang to taiwan are in the news today and part of mm -hmm. what we try and do at the hoover history working group is to apply history uh so let me conclude by asking you how do you see our contemporary uh situation uh given that the situation of the uyghurs uh, in xinjiang mm -hmm. is now a hugely important issue in not only u.s relations with china but the relations of the rest of the world with China, and given that Taiwan looks more and more like the focal point of, well, maybe Cold War II, uh, right. give us some historical perspective on the new uh, significance of these places that you know so well. Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes people want us to sort of drag, draw analogies to the past, but I see what's happening in Xinjiang now as being completely different from what has happened before. And the policies that are being implemented by the, the, the Xi administration and the party state uh, are really assimilative, assimilative um, in ways that were not really possible before because of the types of technologies and the ways that um, the, the, the Chinese party state has been able to sort of vilify these, these, this population in the post 9-11 world. But if I was going to offer a, a sort of lesson from history, I think it would be the, the ways that, you know, most of the time, these authoritative states do need to make some sort of compromises. And the difference that I see right now is that the Xi regime doesn't have to make those. They are able to sort of implement, you know, we're seeing it happening in Hong Kong with the new security law. And I, 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 I see constant parallels between what's happening in Xinjiang and what's happening in Hong Kong. And sadly, um, what seems to be um, further more and more the case in Taiwan. So, you know, I, I really hate to end these things on a depressing and sad note, but um, as much as we can learn from history, I do think that this is a very distinct and different period um, owing to the, the sort of technology that, that the Xi regime has at its disposal. And um, yeah, I, I don't think things are gonna get better before they get much worse. Well, thanks uh, for that sobering uh, reflection, but one can always, uh take it, I think, as being uh, meaningful when, when historians say that things are new or unprecedented. Uh, I think you'll probably be right. There's never really been uh, quite such uh, an aggressive uh, and homogenizing uh, Chinese uh, state and power in Beijing. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much for sharing your insights uh, with us. 
uh, at the Hoover History Working Group. We all wish you huge uh, success uh, with the published book and, of course, with the book that has yet to come, which I shall look forward very much to reading. Thanks a lot. <laughs>